Where would you like to start? I grew up as a young kid in a place called Alexandria, Louisiana. And I live in a very small community, a three-room house, and I have 12 brothers and sisters, so there's 13 of us. In, in, in most abject poverty that you can imagine. There was this work program at a school called Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And my mother and my high school football coach, who thought that I was a very good student who had simply not applied himself appropriately, urged me to go to work in a program whereby during the summer prior to the regular semester, you'd work on campus and ultimately um, you would try to get enough money to help pay for room and board for the school year. And so I went there and I asked them to participate in the program and they rejected me. And uh, I came back throughout that day literally four times begging and pleading to get in the program. And they rejected me. In fact, they rejected me the last time, but then they called me back and said, listen, you can't get in the regular program, but what we can do uh, our outside maintenance crew needs some help and support working with them. If you're willing to work with them, uh, I can ask maybe the head of the dormitory of life on the campus to try to get you in one of the dormitories and we'll give you some of the benefits as though you were in the program. But you're really not in the program. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's what I did all summer. All summer picking up the trash and cutting the grass around the university campus. And somehow I made the decision that I didn't want to do that anymore. And that I want to try to do something better. And it came to me as a young 18 year old kid that that's what I want to do. I'm going to now study. By the time I left school, I was president of all of my classes and I ultimately became the student government president as well. Also, I was fascinated by the military. So they had a very strong ROTC program in campus. And so I engaged in that fully. And by the time I got to the senior year at, uh, at the college, I was a distinguished military graduate. I was a commander of the entire ROTC Brigade. At the same time, I was the student government president at the college. And I found myself, and if you know, going back in the 60s, the student government leaders were very active in the civil rights struggle. So I was very active in the civil rights struggle. March and protest, demonstration. I met people like Dr. King. I, I was engaged in all of those kinds of activities as a young student leader. At the same time, I'm the head of the ROTC Brigade, preparing to go to Vietnam. Some days, I was out protesting as a student leader on civil rights matter against the war in Vietnam. As an officer, simultaneously, I'm preparing to go to Vietnam. And ultimately, I honored my military uh, position and went to Vietnam. Served in Vietnam, served for four years in the military, went all the way up to the rank of captain, and ultimately decided to get out. So that's how the two positions end up being simultaneously. First time that ever happened. I'm the brigade commander and the head of the student government 
and oftentimes those two positions are in conflict. I held both simultaneously. May the light of Christ brighten your path. Signed, Maggie. Merry Christmas. God is always with you. Many of us write and receive lots of Christmas cards during the holidays. God is always with you, Pat. That works. These United Methodist volunteers want to make sure that inmates serving time in Pennsylvania get at least one. Sometimes it's the only piece of mail that they get for years and years because their families disown them. And that's what we're trying to do. Make sure they know they're loved. Share the love and strength God provides you with those around you and with everyone you meet each day. Blessings to you, Donna. In 2016, 8,000 cards will make their way to 10 correctional facilities. Thanks to the work of hundreds of church members who wrote greetings for people they will probably never meet. It's both a ministry for the inside because it really does touch the hearts of the guys on the inside and um, also for the people who send the cards. Scott Johnson carries cards everywhere he goes during the holidays. In Matthew 25, Jesus calls us to visit those who are in prison and not everybody's ready to go inside. And this is a way for people to go inside in a virtual way and to touch people's hearts. Then there was the lady in our church she leaned in and said, I am so glad you are doing this. My son is in prison in another state and I wish somebody was doing this for him. People will come up to me and they'll start to share their stories of people they know who are incarcerated. And these are stories that I get a very strong sense they have not been able to share otherwise because this is not something that's talked about. The Prison Ministry and Restorative Justice team from the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference leads this effort and created simple, printable cards that churches anywhere can download, share, and send to them to distribute. A pair of white socks that the Salvation Army donates. Our church donates 1,300 packs of cheese crackers. Linda McRae's church partners with other United Methodist churches to make care packages to accompany the cards. We go into all the cell blocks and we deliver them. You hear them talking in Bible study how they're alienated from their families. And so they appreciate anything you're giving to them. I lost count. Okay, that's 50. One. The Reverend Patrick Welch, a United Methodist prison chaplain, says the handwritten messages are a treasured gift. Welch once ran into a former inmate on the street long after release. I saw him in Center City, and he's like, oh, Pastor Pat, Pastor Pat, look. And he came up, and he just pulled it out. He had it with him and completely changed civvies just to hold that card. That's how much it meant to him. And it's like, once I saw that, it made this more than just an exercise. You could do this project as a Valentine's Day, you could do it as 4th of July, you could do it any time of the year because people are always looking for some sense that someone on the outside is actually caring about them. I'm praying for you. Merry Christmas, Julia. Some volunteers slice while others dice. They're preparing holiday dishes that will feed needy people in Washington, D.C. Erica Steen organizes the annual event where volunteers prepare 15,000 servings of food. What we found is that even though there are people who are hungry out in our D.C. community, they're hungry year-round, but why can't they enjoy the holiday just like the rest of us? More than 500 people are donating their time to help others. Al Stenstrup says giving back is so important. The whole idea of the food that we're providing here today through the work of the uh, volunteers and the, and the different civic groups that, that are giving back to the community as well means a lot to those that have uh, either fallen on hard times because of the economy or just simply need a break to get back into the workforce and be able to provide for others. For Jessica Adler, community service during the holidays is a tradition. I find it really enjoyable to do this and to bond with other people, and I have been very fortunate and blessed in my life, so I find it very important to give back. 
At DC's Central Kitchen, more volunteers are preparing and cooking holiday meals. Ciara Simonson and her sorority friends want to make a difference. One of my favorite quotes is, the greatest thing in life is to love and be loved in return. And so if that's something that we can remember in our service and our giving and caring for one another, that is the significance of community. Beth Erickson brought along her daughter, Hollis, to volunteer. Which I think is an important part, is to help bring younger people along to understand the importance of service and giving back. And I think everybody else should give at least a couple hours, if not a couple days, to help those less fortunate or those in need. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. Charles is homeless and on the receiving end of the generosity. The people are blessed by giving, period. There is a blessing to give and to receive. In this season of giving, that blessing means so much to those in need. Chris Simpkins, VOA News, Washington. My favorite part of volunteering is just doing it with my friends. I like volunteering because it makes me feel good about myself. It gives me like a thrill to know that I've helped someone. I like it when I see other people happy and it makes me feel happy. I volunteer because I personally think it's good for people to help other people. They should help veterans because they either went for war or they did fight for our nation. I think they should want to volunteer. So that way the whole world can be better, and so that way everyone in the world can be happy. When you're kind to others, it makes them feel warm and welcome inside. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service, veterans. My name is Bill Futornik. I am the ritual director of Congregation Beth Jacob in Redwood City, California. And I brought a group of teenagers mostly, and actually a group last week as well, to Long Island to work with Nahama, uh, which is the Jewish response to disaster. And we're here to rebuild houses. And we're here to help those who were affected by Hurricane Sandy. And we're here to really volunteer and give our time to improve the world. I discovered there's only really one response, uh, uh, one organization, Jewish organization, that was a disaster relief organization, that's Nakama. And I contacted them and they were very quick to get back to me and they just seemed incredibly well organized around this effort. And they said, well, you know, as far as Oklahoma goes, we don't know how much longer we'll be there, but the Sandy uh, rebuilding is going on for another year which was very surprising to me because, you know, the hurricane hits in October and, um, and for a year and a half they're going to have to rebuild. The minute it leaves the newspaper, it seems to leave our consciousness. Once you get on the ground and do it, you kind of see, yeah, you know, that was a pretty transforming experience. And I know that the, the group I had last week felt pretty transformed by the experience. Um, you know, in this group, we, we've been having little debriefs at night and the teens are saying, you know, how incredibly grateful they feel. And if nothing else, it'll make you feel very grateful for the life that you have. My name is Sasha, and I'm here. I'm coming from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, um, for half my life I was in prison, and uh, I just feel like I'm spending the second half of my life mess uh, fixing what I did in the first, and uh, it's just a really wonderful thing to working with these people, and uh, just the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Volunteering, I would say, is the absolute most rewarding thing I've ever done, and uh, it's just so nice being able to help people in need, and uh, it's just, I'd recommend it to anybody. I'm Dahlia Jude, and we're in Massapequa, New York, rebuilding homes after, after Hurricane Sandy. I decided to come here because I figured to make good of my summer of my free time and volunteer was something that I was passionate about and help with what I could. We've been on this house for the whole time so far, just the two of us. My relative's house burned down um, in a fire locally and I knew like what devastation like came to them and I wanted to help people like them um, during my summer. I'm from San Francisco, California and we're working with Nehama. We're here for five days. Even if you don't have any experience like building homes or like you've never done anything like this to like come in here and make such a difference or at least make a little bit of a difference, um, 
is like means a lot to me that I can like learn and kind of know, just help someone out in any way that I can by being here and doing just my part. I think the best part of the volunteer experience is seeing the progress we've made on the houses just over a couple of days and seeing how happy the people who live here are with the work we're doing. I would say it's worth it. It's worth the unpleasant weather and the hard work you do all day because at the end of the day you feel like you're really making a difference and that's more than you would make by not doing it so you feel not only good about yourself but you feel good about the work you're doing and the people you're helping so I would just say it's a great experience and I recommend it. What motivated me to join AmeriCorps VISTA was really just being able to give back to the community which I represent. I've grown up in this community and from that everything has come in full circle. My name is Iskander Youssef, 23 years old and a native of St. Paul. New Lens is a multi-generational mentoring organization. All our focus is to be promoting positivity for black males. Our community necessarily doesn't have a lot of positive role models to be looking up to. We focus on eighth grade. It's that age right before high school, which is extremely pivotal. Our mentors are paired with elder mentees, and our mentees are paired with those mentors as well. And they'll be playing activities like tennis, like archery, like boxing. It gives them real positive mentors to be looking up to. Black communities across the U.S. have been disrupted by a lot of different forms of violence. And one of the most damaging ones was disruption of institutions and processes that we had to take care of our young people and our youth. AmeriCorps Vista's presence within our organization has been a tremendous blessing. Not only did they come in with that kind of passion and with that kind of understanding, but they came ready to be a part of something bigger than themselves. We're able to provide almost instant impact in the community. We have 175 mentees in St. Paul Public Schools. Think about the ripples that that's gonna have not only within the schools, but the ripple that's gonna have within the communities that they represent, within the houses that they uphold. Let's just say that that one individual of 175 is impacting five people that are around him. Well, if you times that by 175, then we're in crazy numbers. Then we're in good numbers for our community. If you support youth, then you, you shape the future. You can instantly see the positive impact that it's provided for them. They're smiling more. They don't fight anymore. They know that they have a community and people that they can uphold to. Having the autonomy to be creating something within a nonprofit organization that can be sustaining it for the long term is something that is very nourishing for me. But also, I'm not done yet. You have this vision for what you want your community to be, and you're not going to stop until it's there. That, and that's always the, the drive. To me, as an AmeriCorps VISTA, it really has allowed me to be doing that. It, is, it has allowed me to be providing a positive impact in my community. It has provided me a, a way to be connecting and to be building capacity in an organization in which I, I can represent. Being a foster grandparent has definitely given me a purpose in life. I love Grandma Lydia. My favorite thing about Grandma Kara is doing a lot of fun activities. Just been so happy, just so much more energy than being at home alone, doing nothing but watching TV. It's the best part of my life. I'm a better student because of her. She helps me with reading sometimes. I am so proud of the work that I do here. The best part of being a foster grandparent volunteer, watching the light light up in the kids' eyes. Couldn't be more satisfying. It makes a difference that you get involved with young people. Being a foster grandparent has been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience for me, and I'm not going to give it up. I'm living again, and the foster grandparent did that for me. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Grandma Carol. Thanks, Grandma Jen, for helping me.
The tornado touched down on the southwest side of Joplin shortly before 6 p.m. on May 22, 2011. Almost immediately it was massive, a powerful and deadly rotating column of air that would go on to carve a path of unimaginable destruction through one of the most densely populated areas in southwestern Missouri. While the scattered remains of homes, businesses, and lives have mostly been cleared away, the breathtaking magnitude of the historic storm is still clear. Few structures have been rebuilt. Concrete slabs line barren lots like the tombstones of former homes and families. More than 160 people perished in the tornado, and the community is still shaken. Storms of such force are exceedingly rare. The EF5 tornado was the deadliest in the United States since modern record keeping began in 1950. Rebuilding this small Midwestern city is ongoing. It will take years to complete. This April, St. Joseph students from both campuses visited Joplin for an alternative spring break trip. They went to help rebuild. They went to help with relief. These are some of their stories. Joplin, Missouri presented a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to the group that traveled there on the alternative spring break, a trip that has become an annual tradition at St. Joseph's. Unlike previous trips, the chosen location was the setting of an almost inconceivable natural disaster. None of the students had ever seen damage of such scope. It was an experience they won't soon forget. It looks like a nuclear bomb just hit this place, but we're, um, they're rebuilding little by little pieces by pieces, but they're doing good. But in some places, it looks like it's just totally destroyed. I don't think um, anyone really understood how it, it was until you like saw it. I mean, we all saw um, like the videos on the news channels, but when you're here, it's, um, it's definitely a shocker. To help with the monumental task of rebuilding, St. Joseph sent a team of 21 students and staff from both campuses to Joplin to volunteer on a series of projects. Campus Ministry Director Pat Tracy considers the trip to be among the most unique opportunities that SJC has to offer. Over the years, we've found that when we offer an alternate to the regular commercial travel, where sometimes it's about selfish uh, behavior, instead, we go somewhere where there's a need, either helping the vulnerable, maybe somebody who's been the victim of a disaster, maybe an underserved community, and sometimes both. The main project for the week was the construction of a series of vibrant garden boxes and complimentary memorial garden in the schoolyard of Cecil Floyd Elementary, which was heavily damaged by the tornado. The project was devised by the nonprofit organization Relief Spark, which was the host organization for the trip. For college kids to give up their spring break on some warm beach, to come out to a city that's been destroyed by a tornado or a flood says a lot about their character as a person. They care about the community. They care about the people that they're interacting with. They, they have heart. They want to make a difference. And they're, they're here to work, work, work. And at the end, they see a magnificent result, like this garden. I mean, it's incredible what they've created. Students also worked with AmeriCorps and were sent to several sites around Joplin throughout the week to help with debris cleanup and construction projects. Their reasons for donating their time varied only slightly. Most of them just wanted to help. Uh, it just felt like a great opportunity. It kind of sprung up in front of me and I thought uh, they needed the help and I have the free time so I might as well contribute. I do a lot of volunteering during the summer, similar to stuff like this, maintaining property and um, I was excited that St. Joe's had something like that for me to do. I just wanted to give back, give back to the community, give back to these wonderful people out here. And it, it just, it feels great to do that. The tornadoes hit last year and I was like devastated by it. And I was like, I want to do whatever I can to help. And when they said Joplin, Missouri, I was like right down there and I wanted to help. That's why I came. Russell Gerke, an engineer and inventor based in Independence, Missouri, has devoted his life to developing a state-of-the-art storm shelter since the tornado hit Joplin. To bring his life-saving innovations to life, Gerke has relied on volunteers like those from St. Joe's to help in the assembly of the shelters, which are fabricated from a polymer used in the construction of playground equipment. Everybody knows somebody that's died. They see the damage every day. I mean, the town's rebuilding. The landscape has changed, but the emotional landscape is still messed up. And part of uh, the healing process is having a safe place to go when at home or at school or whatever. 
you know, those kids need that anchor. So fear, fear is a, you know, it's kind of like a sickness. It really is. When they get a shelter, it's like you cured them of a disease. The trip to Joplin was life changing for all the students that had the privilege of going. The power of nature is humbling, but the outpouring of support from volunteers has helped the healing process for those whose lives were uprooted. They're amazing. I think they're cool, fun, and amazing. Great hearts, and some of them have actually worked inside with kids off and on throughout the week, and I have had wonderful feedback from my teachers about them as well. So they're kind and interesting, and um, you know, what an amazing thing to do to give up your spring break to go help um, folks rebuild. We are volunteers creating media about volunteer organizations, telling their stories and encouraging volunteerism. Then follow stories on travel television. Where Traveling for Purpose features people who want to give back to their community. My name is Colette Lambert. I'm from Herndon, Virginia. My name is Rob Saunders. My name is Brad Mora, and we're in Far Rockaway. My name is Jamie Crumpler. I'm, I'm from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And I'm here to hopefully make a difference. Um, I'm really simply just a neighbor helping out another neighbor. And I'm here to uh, work on houses that were damaged uh, or destroyed by Hurricane Sandy. We put in a project together to fix people's houses after Hurricane Sandy, two years. It's my first trip to Long Island. Uh, this is my second trip. Uh, this is my fifth uh, mission trip uh, to do restoration work. And, and I have had the privilege of helping in, in other um, areas such as New Orleans and some local projects at home as well.